Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We apologize for the echoing. Um, I've just managed to mute uh, my phone and we are going to continue as um, you could tell there was a bit of echo and we were just kindly introducing Professor Sabelo Jane Lovu uh, Gatsaini, who's going to be focused on decolonization as a method. So I'm here with uh, Dr. Latang Sechele. Would you like to say a few words? Oh, I nearly slipped. Uh, uh, good morning uh, or afternoon all over the world. I'm just happy to meet you. Just to confirm that uh, indeed I am uh, uh, Dr. Latan Sekele. Yeah, uh, I'll remove my mask so that you can see me. So co-chairing here with uh, Dr. Mashumba. Thank you. All right, so at this moment, I would like to call uh, to the stage or to the microphone, uh, Professor uh, Gatsheni, please uh, take the floor. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction and uh, greetings to all of you. I hope I'm, I'm very clear. Oh, yes, you are. Please yes. go ahead. Yep. So, so thank you for the, for the invitation to this uh, important conference, the first international uh, and the interdisciplinary conference on spatial methods for urban sustainability. Uh, I've been uh, listening as a participant to the previous speakers speaking about the technical issues uh, <clears throat> of interdisciplinary research. I think I will change the, the tone a bit to, to what I will call politics of knowledge and the uh, sociology of knowledge. And they steer a bit to the pond uh, and they're bringing in some issues which are of macro uh, relevance uh, to these issues of uh, method. So <clears throat> I thought of uh, this topic of uh, decolonization as method uh, because this conference is taking place at a time of insurgence and resurgence of decolonization in the 21st century. And in the light of this, I thought perhaps if we also anchor the, the question of decolonization, it might actually frame some of the works which are going to be presented in this conference. And I saw that there are a number of uh, papers which are going to talk about the issue of decolonizing methodology. So what I'm going to do, of course, I'm not from urban, urban studies. I'm not from urban planning. I'm not from urban design. So I won't actually try, even try to enter into those, those, those that, that, that field. I will speak really in a broad sense about what can be gained uh, if we focus on decolonization as a method uh, and what else can be gained uh, for special methods for urban sustainability. Uh, I will try to, to, to speak in a very broad terms about how epistemology frames ontology. And I will try to also speak in broad terms about how, <clears throat> about the complexity of politics of knowledge of which a method is just one of them. And uh, I will try also to, <clears throat> to then at the end, speak about um, uh, the issue of decolonizing and the, its implications for method. Uh, I'm, I'm, my thinking on uh, decolonization as method comes from the work which I've been doing uh, in, the, in the field of decolonial uh, <clears throat> studies, uh, as well as epistemologies of the global south, as you had. I have a chair in epistemologies of the global south here at the University of Beirut in Germany. But I'm influenced in speaking this way by a number of works, which I think it would be important for me to go through them very quickly. Uh, the first one is the work of um, Linda Tuai Smith, uh, Decolonizing Methodologies, Research and Indigenous People, first published in 1999, a book which highlights how research 
how research methods and indeed how knowledge itself were implicated in the throes of imperialism and colonialism. And they made a strong case for decolonization of method as a means towards reclamation of indigenous ways of knowing and being. And this way the reclamation was also used by the previous speakers about how do we bring everyone in. Uh, the second book, which also influences my thinking is by Chela Sander, Sandoval, entitled Method, Methodology of the Oppressed, published in 2000, which is not about research method per se, but methods for creating oppositional liberation consciousness in pursuit of struggles for justice and a shifting uh, from existing theory and a laying out key aspects of a methodology of emancipation predicated on semiotics, on uh, deconstruction, on meta-ideologizing, democratic, democra democratics and differential consciousness. And the third book, which I think is also important for us to think about decolonization as method, is the one by <clears throat> Kuan Hissing Chen, entitled Asia as Method, published in 2010, which underscores the need to undo Eurocentric frameworks so as to transcend divisive elements of historically constructed and imposed by colonialism in power relations through patriarchy, sexism, heterosexism, uh, and the uh, narrow nationalism. And uh, he actually underscores uh, two methodologies, the methodology of decolonizing, the methodology of de-imperializing. And uh, the fourth one is by a scholar who I think is in the audience here, uh, because he's going to be speaking here, uh, uh, Bakele Chilisa, the book on indigenous research methodologies published in 2012, where she posited that decolonizing is thus a process of conducting research in such a way that the world views of those who have suffered a long history of oppression and marginalization are given space to communicate from their frames of reference. And I also draw from the works of the Latin American decolonial theories, particularly their concepts of coloniality and the decoloniality, which enable a deeper understanding of what colonialism has done to the world. And it also underscores the need for us to revisit decolonization as an unfinished project. <clears throat> but the ideal starting point to talk about uh, decolonization as method is also to then define, try to define what is colonialism and what is decolonization. And I will move very fast on that. <clears throat> I think the best in conception of colonialism maybe comes from Achille Bembe who argued that at the center of the question of colonialism was always this question, to who does the earth belong? Which the colonialists and imperialists wanted to monopolize for themselves. And they wanted to invent, conquer, claim, name, and they own for themselves. And they, you can think about that in relation also to James Blout's idea of the colonizer's model of the world which actually saw the world outside Europe as empty, as empty lands, and the, which was available for invasion, for conquest, for ownership. And the, I'm raising this so that we think about decolonizing, of, we think about colonialism, not as an event, but as a planetary process, which destructured and restructured the world in accordance with the the colonizer's model and the, in accordance with the cognitive and economic interests of capitalism. But colonialism itself can be read as method if we actually expand our idea of method because they were, they, they, there was method in what they were doing. The, the method involved enslavement, involved genocide, involved the conquest, involved the cartography, involved the displacement, involved the dispossession, exploitation, theft of history, killing of other knowledges, languages, and cultures, and indeed dehumanization and redefining, renaming, and reowning. And if we agree with this brief articulation of our, our colonialism, therefore decolonization 
image as a method which seeks to dismantle, to disconstruct, to descend, reverse and undo the colonizer's model of the world. And if we, we think this way, therefore, we need also to maybe turn to the works of Nguk Wationgo, who made a strong case for decolonization when he posited that we have to courtly and consciously look at what imperialism has been doing to us and our view of ourselves in the universe and defining therefore uh, decolonization as a search for a, liberation, a liberating perspective within which to see ourselves clearly in relationship to ourselves and other selves in the universe. And going further to explain that decolonization, if the simplest is to understand it as a quest for relevance. And indeed, in giving us also two other important concepts, uh, which makes us understand decolonization as a method of remembering. Remembering with an R, E, and a hyphen, remembering. Remembering, in other words, picking the pieces after a process of dismemberment. And you can also refer to the work of uh, Franz Fanon, who, who, who cautioned us that, let's not think about decolonization as merely a counter argument to, to colonialism. It is more than that. It entails rehumanization, the elimination of alienation and the invention of new forms of life. Indeed, if we think about it, methodologically as a method of renewing oneself and a self-definition after many years of being defined by others. And I think this will be relevant to this conference to take into account. And it, it actually entails rejection of mimicry and the subversion of the colonial law. In other words, enabling those who have been subjected to imperialism, colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy, to take charge of their own destiny. And he actually pitches, this is Fanon, he pitches this definition at a planetary scale by saying for Europe, for ourselves, for humanity, comrades, we must turn over a new leaf. We must work out new concepts and try to set afoot a new man. And with specific reference to subjectivity, a Fanon envisioned a decolonization as enabling new and sovereign subjectivity of craftsmen and the craftswomen, that is people who are able to do things for themselves. So that decolonization as a method, it is that of restoring what Kwame Nkrumah termed the African genius, the ability to do things for, <clears throat> for oneself. And, it, and it, this takes me to, to another contextual framing which I wanted to share with you, which is why do we talk about um, decolonization as method? I think one, 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 one big context is that knowledge from my own understanding seems to be a creator of reality. And, uh, and I'm not alone in thinking this way because uh, scholars like Mignolo and the Walsh, they also seem to be arguing along the same lines. That knowledge has a privileged position. It occupies the level of the enunciated where the content of the conversation is established and it occupies the level of enunciation which regulates the terms of the conversation. And if we agree with this, therefore our discussions today on spatial methods for sustainability needs to take seriously the issue of the epistemic questions far beyond the question of methods. <clears throat> and uh, Mignolo goes on to speak about knowledge. If we speak about politics, if we speak about economy, if we speak about cities, if we speak about urban spaces, again, we must understand that they have an epistemic base. They, they are conceived epistemically before they are laid down physically. So it is important that we go back to this fundamental epistemic question. Hence, I thought it would be important for me to speak about the broad question of decolonization. Um, and the, I want to, to move on to, to also 
say when you are focusing on issues of methods at this conjuncture, there is no way we can do so without first of all, taking into account the complex contemporary politics of knowledge, whereby the questions of does uh, identity matter in knowledge? Does geography matter in knowledge? Does knowledge have a biography? Does knowledge have, a, what is the role of ideology in knowledge? Of course, we're coming from a background whereby there was a strong belief in a, in a non-situated uh, universal objective, uh, neutral ways of producing knowledge. But I think what is upon us now during this time of resurgence and insurgence uh, or decolonization is that there is a rethinking of those basic epistemological and the methodological questions. And there is, there is a pressure on us to really think deeply about the eco-politics of knowledge, the role of identity in knowledge, the geopolitics of knowledge, and the body politics of knowledge, uh, so that what we are talking about and what we wish to establish in terms of sustainable, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, sustainable cities is framed properly. And this thinking took me to a, a concept which I think will be important here in this conference. And that is the concept of the cognitive empire and the concept which is borrowed from Latin American theories, which is the question of coloniality of knowledge. And, they, and they, in this, I'm also informed by people like um, <clears throat> uh, Steve Bantupigo, who always, who posted the, who once posited that the most important weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the control of the minds of the oppressed. And they, I wondered how that could be, that could be possible. And this took me to, <clears throat> to the concept of cognitive empire which speaks about the invasions of the mental universe of other people, so as to impose particular knowledge systems and methodologies and displacing others and consequently shaping their consciousness. And the, I thought it would be important for us to understand how this happens as we think about the special methods for sustainability. And the, I will share with you a few uh, <clears throat> understanding of some of the methods of subjugation of human life to particular forms of power, whereby we will need to understand that the modern world system and its global order within which we are trying to, to rethink the special methods for sustainability. It's a world order where we still live as a people who are socially classified and racially hierarchized as a human population. And in this process, we, we are still um, <clears throat> framed in terms of different, differential ontological densities as a result. So there is still a, a problematic social pyramid which emerged in which some people are enjoying superiority and others are pushed into inferiority. Some are pushed into subhuman and the others are totally denied humanity itself. In other words, dismembered and dehumanized. So we will need to, to go back to these, to these realities and not create an impression that we are now living as equal people, enjoying the same, <clears throat> the same status as human beings. And this takes us also to the important question of today, which is the question of knowledge, whereby those who have been uh, pushed to the subhuman category and even out of the human family itself, they are also said to have no knowledge. Uh, they have no epistemic virtue and are depicted <clears throat> as people who are living through superstitions rather than science. And they, this has implications for methods because such a people are reduced to objects of research and are put, if I can use the example, they are literally put on a magnifying glass like microorganisms being studied now and then. And all this culminated in epistemological invasions accompanied by denial of other ways of knowing. So when we're speaking about methodology, 
we need to be saying methodology from which knowledge system. <clears throat> and then we also need to reflect on the questions of power. And I don't think I need to overemphasize that. I think everyone is aware of that. But this background also takes us to then think about the moment we are living in, the moment which some will, <clears throat> will present as a, a moment in knowledge terms, the global economy of knowledge in which it might actually be problematic to speak about binaries, centers, and the peripheries. But I want to, 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 to underscore that, of course, even myself, I wish that I live in a world where there is a global economy of knowledge in which all knowledge is uh, taken seriously, but that's not the reality on the ground. And I also wish that in the knowledge domain, we have partnerships, collaboration, and the co-production of knowledge, but again, that is not what is obtaining in the ground. On the ground, we will find that there is still an even intellectual division of labor, with Africa being more and more a site of fieldwork for scholars from somewhere. <clears throat> and uh, those on the continent, still uh, many of them embark on uh, hunting and the gathering of raw data, which is then processed in, uh, <clears throat> in, in, uh, in North America and Europe. And, uh, all this then culminates in a, in, a, in a situation which has implications for methodology, for theory, and for knowledge itself, whereby we then witness what uh, Pauline Untonji, the philosopher from Benin, speak about in terms of academic dependency. Uh, dependency on methods from somewhere, dependency on theory from somewhere, and the dependency uh, on, method, on concepts themselves from somewhere which sometimes are not relevant to Africa. <clears throat> and this also takes us to the other problem, which is a persistent problem in the knowledge domain. And I think it has also implications for method. And that is the language which we use in the, in the academy and in intellectual debates. We still continue to use the languages, <clears throat> the colonial languages and the, the African languages are not actually at the center of the academy. And it, all this has consequences. And the, the first consequence, I think, is uh, well articulated by Nguk Wathiong, who, who is speaking about <clears throat> the metaphysical empire, then says it actually detonates a cultural bomb at the center of a universe of a people. And uh, this has long-term effects. And uh, if I can read him, he says the effects of cultural bomb is to annihilate people's belief in their names, in their languages, in their environment, in their heritage of struggle, in their unity, in their capacities, and ultimately in themselves. It makes them see their past as one wasteland of non-achievement. And it makes them want to distance themselves from that wasteland. It makes them want to identify with that which is furthest removed from them with other people's languages rather than their own. And he goes on to say, what the cognitive empire does is that it removes the hard disk of previous knowledge and memory. And he puts it this way, get a few natives, empty their hard disk of previous memory and download into them a soft way of European memory. And he also speaks about the dislocation of the mind. And he says the colonial process dislocates the traveler's mind from the place he or she already knows to a foreign starting point even with the body still remaining in his or her homeland. It is a process of continuous alienation from the base, a continuous process of looking at oneself from outside of self with the lenses of a stranger. One may end up identifying with the foreign base as the starting point towards self. That is from another self towards oneself rather than the one being, doesn't the local being the starting point from self to other. And this actually, resonates with what Fanon also spoke about in terms of alienation and the pitfalls of consciousness in which you were speaking about a reality which is very hard to comprehend, a reality of vague knowledge of oneself and the, the, social, dis, uh, the social dislocation in which a person who is located on the oppressed side of, of power relations does not automatically speak from a subaltern position, as, as, as Ramon Grosfokel will put it. And an epistemic problem 
in which uh, people who are socially located in the oppressed side of colonial difference always attempted to think epistemically as ones on the dominant positions. And again, you can get that from uh, uh, <clears throat> the work of Ramon Grosfoke. And it, this has consequences which are documented by people like William E.P. Du Bois, double consciousness, people like Kata Godwin as miseducation, people like Pauline Utonji as academic dependence, people like Al Mazuri as cultural schizophrenia. But I want to, 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 to bring it down to us as academics gathers in this conference, uh, because it has implications, very practical implications in the way we, we do, we produce knowledge in the sense that it then produces some of us as radical emulators and assimilators of what the cognitive empire has imposed. So much so that we then are adherents of objectivity and situatedness, universal truth, cognitive neutrality, standards and protocols of excellence from the cognitive empire itself. And the idea that we are scholars who are just fascinated by ideas and we strictly adhere to conventional methodologies without questioning them. And I think it is important for us to think beyond this. And there are others who will react through what we call liminarity or in-betweenness, uh, always being in Norway, uh, not taking a clear position in these intellectual debates. And then there are others who then get angry and then uh, adopt the position of radical alterity or radical difference, trying to reject everyone, everything. Uh, and that also can be very problematic because it can lead to nativism, to, 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 to ghettoization. And then there are others who, who react by actually adopting what I will call a psychophantic tradition. Uh, they turn into regimes, intellectuals, and they adopt comrade positions. Then the one which I am trying to, to speak from is what we call decolonization, in which there is still pursuit of the, the struggle to complete the project of decolonization and doing the cognitive empire speaking truth to power and commitment to scholarship and epistemic freedom. The idea perhaps of what, what, what have been called organic intellectuals. But as I go towards the end of this presentation, I want then to talk about decolonization as method. And I want to say that decolonization as method must be understood as a long standing epistemic, political and ethical intellectual movement. And I want to also say that it does not consist of only one, one school of thought. It is in the name of, uh, <clears throat> in the way uh, Nelson Matonato Torres defined it, a family of diverse positions. Uh, so it is not one school of thought, but what is important is that we understand that it, it actually emerges immediately with the colonial encounters itself. And they, it responds to particular questions. It will not, we will not be talking about decolonization as a method if there was no colonization as a method. And that, that I think we need to, 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 to understand. And, they, and they, this colonization as a method, which actually reproduced and invented black people, invented blackness, and they misrepresented Africanness as deficient and lacking beings, and therefore, provoking decolonization as seeking self-determination, self-definition and self-representation. And, the, and the, if I can speak about it uh, in terms of its categories, uh, drawing on the work of Eleluane uh, Lamakudu, uh, Chose and the others, uh, who identified about four dimensions of decolonization, the structural, the epistemic, the personal and the relational with the structural as a method of dismantling the structures of exploitation for purposes of redistribution of material resources, which were concentrated by colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy in the hands of the few. And the epistemic as a method of recovery of ways of knowing that have been subjected to the cognitive empire, rejection of the colonial idea that valid, legitimate and scientific knowledge comes from Europe, which enables epistemic violence and advancing the gender of plurality of knowledges and the personal 
learning to unlearn in order to relearn through cultivation of consciousness, which privileges epistemic freedom, which rejects complicity in sustenance and the replication of coloniality and the relationality, which is a recognition of interdependence of human beings based on what Francis Nyamjo terms incompleteness and the promotion of dialogical generation of knowledge and the collective commitment to rewelding along the domination free and the egalitarian lines. And, the, and the, this a idea of, of a decolonization as method speaks about the refusal of relying on the limited knowledge of a minority, one fifth of the world population consisting of white men, which exclude even white women in the knowledge, in the knowledge uh, <clears throat> production. A method of addressing what um, Bonaventura de Santos have termed the cognitive injustices, which emerge from colonial and post-colonial non-recognition of other ways of knowing. A method of recognition of knowledge is emerging from the benefits of history and the struggles, uh, <clears throat> which are known as epistemologies of the global South. And a method of laying the foundation for ecologies of knowledge as a way of democratizing knowledge itself. And a, indeed a method which is underpinned by the values of what I have termed the epistemic freedom, which include, which actually cascade from what Steve Bigo once said, I write what I want, the freedom to think as one is self and to think from where one is located. And a, indeed a method which facilitates thinking across intellectual traditions, which I think this conference speaks about it in terms of interdisciplinarity. The thinking across intellectual traditions instead of imprisonment of thinking in one academic tradition. And the, indeed a method which recognizes that the global South is a majority world with very rich knowledge, which for over 500 years has been subjugated. And I want to end by saying, by quoting drawing from Emmanuel Wallerstein, who spoke about our age as the age of uncertainties of knowledge, which he celebrated as enabling a reopening of the basic epistemological questions and the reorganization of knowledge. And I think that is the stage where we are. And this is why I thought it would be important for us not to run away from this question of decolonization. I hope I have contributed to raising some of the basic epistemological and the, indeed the methodological questions as part of contributing to the advancement of knowledge on spatial methods for urban sustainability. What I can say with certainty is that today at a planetary scale, there is profound dissatisfaction with institutional cultures, ways of knowing and doing, as well as method and methodologies that emerge from colonialism, capitalism and patriarchy as systems of power. There is increasing struggles for rethinking thinking itself and the decolonization in gaining planetary resonance uh, is gaining planetary resonance as a method for change. And if indeed we are committed to this agenda of a method of spatial <clears throat> of spatiality for urban sustainability, I think we need to invest a lot of energy in rethinking thinking itself because we cannot use the thinking which actually created these problem, these urban problems, and they think that very method, that very knowledge which is problematic, will actually make us uh, produce sustainable uh, uh, urban sustainability. Uh, I think it is also important that we take into account that there is a planetary movement for decon decanonization of knowledges that have been canonized by colonialism. <clears throat> With the resurgence and the insurgence of decolonization of the 21st century, we have to rise adequately, and this includes me, we have to rise adequately to the systemic and existential challenges and go deeper, even into reviewing the disciplinary base of the modern knowledge, the normative foundations of modern critical theory, and they confront the dirty, racial, gendered, and the colonial history of embedded in methods. For special methods of of urban sustainability, there is need for us to think deeply about non-extractive methods, which shifts paradigmatically from the object-subject relations to subject-to-subject -subject relations in research process, as well as co-production of knowledge predicated on the decolonial agenda, which I will summarize as 
all human beings are born into valid and legitimate knowledge systems. I thank you and I will end here. Uh, thank you very much for that informative presentation. And um, as we were all listening to this uh, presentation, uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to open up for questions. Uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just as a summary of some of the things that I caught on, uh, Professor here was saying that, um, you know, decolonization uh, as a method does not consist of one school of thought, uh, but it's also about opening up um, space for free thinking. And he also said, you know, we actually also need to rethink thinking itself, uh, which is quite a powerful and it has had me uh, thinking of a number of ways I could also uh, rethink uh, the way I think. And indeed, opening up spaces to critique positions of power and dominant culture, as well as the relationship between the researcher uh, and the researchee. And he gave an example of how people who are superstitious uh, are often studied under a magnifying uh, glass. So this is a really good uh, and eye-opening uh, presentation where decolonizing research will therefore bring on a different uh, ontological and epistemic epistemological perspectives and different disciplines and we can all try and incorporate them as researchers. Uh, Dr. Sachele, do you want to add on anything? Yeah, uh, yeah thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor, for uh, that uh, presentation. Uh, it's a really uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, we were uh, hoping that we will receive uh, some questions uh, from uh, the floor, which you can uh, uh, address. But uh, looking at uh, you know the chats, uh, we we don't have. Uh, okay, uh, uh, my uh, co-director is saying that there are some questions uh, that uh, you have to address. Uh, I'm sure uh, she will be able to read. Uh, the, the, some of the questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, so one of the comments was, uh, dear Prof. Ndlovu Gatseni, could you elaborate a little bit on epistemology, especially on your understanding of the relation or the relation? No, the relation of epistemology and knowledge. Hmm. Um, did you get that, Prof? Yes. Uh, okay. Maybe if we can take about three, if there are more. Okay. Uh, we have a Tsepo Masu who just wanted to thank you uh, for a great uh, presentation. Uh, and just as a question that I have uh, myself, I just wanted to ask um, if sometimes it's the data, the research, or researchers themselves who need to be decolonized. Okay. No, thank, thank you, so I'll give you a moment to answer. No, thank you so much for that. Um, I think, uh, let me start with yours, which is speak about who has or what has to be decolonized. I think the issue is, the problem is me and you, is us who are produced by this, uh, these modern westernized institutions of learning, uh, which at the center they resides the cognitive empire. So to be honest, I think it starts with me and you if we decolonize ourselves. And that's a very, a very difficult uh, uh, <clears throat> act to, 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 to embark on in the sense that it really is about deep self-introspection. Uh, and that deep self-introspection is what maybe others speak about it in terms of subjecting oneself to a painstaking process of learning to unlearn in order to relearn. 
and uh, that process is, or, or, or you go to the extent of going this issue of moving from miseducation to re-education. And uh, this, this, this really needs a lot of commitment and uh, a lot of realization that what we call knowledge or education, which we acquired might actually be problematic and uh, even limiting in terms of our imagination of alternatives to alternatives, as 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 Paul uh, Ventura de Sousa Santos will say, and uh, <clears throat> this I think also links with the first question, which is talking about epistemology, and uh, and the knowledge. I, I actually use the term epistemology and knowledge interchangeable uh, with epistemology as ways of knowing, but I think what I was trying to say in this lecture. Uh, building on the works of uh, <clears throat> of others who have done work before me, is this issue about what about if we think about uh, what is the relationship between knowledge and reality, or what is the relationship between epistemology and ontology? And uh, the point I was trying to to put forward was that um, we can think about knowledge as framing reality or epistemology as creating ontology. And if we think that way, therefore, it actually becomes important for us to go to knowledge itself, because some of the issues which appear on the surface as institutional problems, as systemic problems, they are fundamentally epistemic problems. So that's why maybe the whole world is taken up by this question of epistemological decolonization, that perhaps without dealing with that question of knowledge, without dealing with that question of these knowledges which took us for over 500 years and they put us where we are today, uh, might not be the same knowledges which can take us into the future. Hence, we need to think deeply about the questions of epistemology. And I went on to end by talking about Emmanuel Wallerstein, who worked a lot on the questions of sociology of knowledge. And his idea was that there is deep uncertainty of knowledge uh, during the present conjuncture to the extent that the basic epistemological questions are, are now open. And the basic uh, methodological questions are now open. There is nothing which can be taken for granted at this moment. Uh, you will need to go back to these issues about what does identity influence the way I think? Does my geographical location uh, determine how I think? Does knowledge really have an ideology? And, uh, and uh, this, this challenge is the long held idea that you can be objective, truthful, universally. That, that, that is no longer really just accepted as that. Uh, the, 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 there is a, a lot of a lot of knowledge which is emerging, which is saying people think from where they are. The, our sex, our our race, our ethnic our ethnicity, all what we carry in 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 our bodies and minds determine the knowledge which we produce. And uh, that's that's what I was trying to 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 put forward. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for, for that. Uh, we have uh, another question here. Or oh, uh, one of them is a request uh, that, uh, uh, you know, from Sahayat uh, Baku Gupta. Uh, we'd like to request if you can uh, provide the references the, uh, uh, that you actually used either on the chat or some way uh, where you can send even to uh, the, the organizers. I think I think let me try to send to the organizers. It, I was actually speaking to some notes here, so they are not in a very good order. But we, I can send something. Yeah. Uh, another one here. Uh, a question is: uh, If, as it is said in the previous talks, that uh, both the global north and the global south are both colonized by dominant epistemologies, then both of them need to be uh, decolonized. Mm. What will that uh, assertion weaken? Uh, will that assertion weaken the struggles and resistance of the global South? Does that mean 
that the discourses of the global north mm. uh, is being co-opted by the uh, by, by the global no they are probably <laughs> they, was, they wanted to say the discourses of the global south are being co-opted by the global north yeah yeah in fact i get exactly what what the question is about i think one of the issues which when i started uh, i started by talking about two two related issues the issue of colonialism and the issue of decolonization and i tried to pitch both at a planetary scale and by a pitching them at a planetary scale i was trying to say the question of decolonization is not only a question of the global south it is really a planetary question and i will try to demonstrate that uh, there is need in the global north for de-imperialization the superiority complex, which might actually be uh, sustaining some of the, 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 the actions of the global North are also born out of colonialism, just like the imposed inferiority is born out of colonialism. So you can't deal with inferiority uh, which was imposed and they leave the superiority like that. Uh, I remember this, uh, this joke by by one of the scholars which was talking about this person who became crazy and he was running away from chickens always thinking that he was corn he would be eaten by chickens until he had to go to the psychiatric ward to be reoriented that but you are a human being you can't be eaten by chickens but after he was released from the psychiatric hospital the person came back after 30 minutes running away from chickens okay and the doctors asked Oh, we thought we had reoriented you. What is the problem? He says the chicken. Then they were disappointed. They thought the, the therapy did not work. But the guy explained that, no, no, no. The therapy worked. I now know that I'm a human being, but have you dealt with the chicken? The chicken seems to be following me the, the way it was following me previously. In other words, he was talking about this dialectic that you can't solve one, one side and leave the other side like that. And in the same manner, when we're talking about decolonization, you can't deal with those who have been the victims of colonization and they not deal with the colonizers is thinking. What about if they continue with the colonizers model of the world in their mind and they still carry it? The, the world will be in danger of such a people. So it will be important that when we talk about decolonization, we also talk about imperialization. Hence in my work, I try to develop about what I called the 10 Ds of decolonization, which actually do not speak only about the global south, they speak at a planetary scale, starting with the deimperialization as the first D, and the second debourgeoisement of the world in such a way that we don't make a bourgeois life the template of life of everyone. People have different lives, and the depatriarchization, which is a planetary problem, not only a problem of the of the global south, but emanating also from a from um, the colonial experience uh, and the decorporatization, all of us today, we are actually living under neoliberal corporatist world. And then we will need to decorporatize as part of, of the, and the decanonization, which I spoke about in terms of making sure that we decanonize some knowledge so that other knowledges will come into the space and then we establish an ecology of knowledges. And the deparochalization in which you don't actually work with a very limited archive. You need to open up to the other archives and the, the other theories. And the perhaps desecularization, because secularization was also part and parcel of, of colonialism. Interesting enough that by the time they were adopting secular, secular thinking in Europe, they were sending missionaries to still continue with the, 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 the religious aspect on the, on the African continent. And the deracialization, which I need to, not to explain, and the de-universalization so that we open up to pluriversity because the universalization uni mean, means one. It means there is a, a, a particular mode of thought which, 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 which cannot be, and the de-hierarchization which actually speaks about destroying these vertical hierarchical structures of power so that everyone has a good chance of living. And I hope I've addressed that question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. 
Uh, I would like to invite anyone from the audience that have um, a question, uh, please uh, raise your hand or come the side, then we can give you a moment uh, to ask a question. So Rasa Chele would ask uh, further questions. Uh, we have uh, another question here from the South. Uh, they are uh, questioning uh, where, uh, you, from where you are speaking. Uh, mm -hmm. especially that uh, you are now operating from the global north mm -hmm. and they're saying how is it uh, possible for you mm -hmm. now to uh, be talking about uh, decolonization mm -hmm. when you are not located here but you are absolutely in the global north mm -hmm. and maybe an, another related issue may be uh you know if uh, the, uh, the global north also need to be uh, decolonized uh, who is supposed to be uh, to uh, ensure that uh, uh, they are decolonized, and how is this really accepted in the uh, in the northern uh, hemisphere? Uh, these are two important and related questions. I think. I think um, uh, I moved very fast in one of the, the 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 sections where I was supposed to address this this aspect about social location geographical location and the epistemic location. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important that we have clarity on those because it doesn't mean that people who are located on the continent are actually thinking decolonially. A lot of them, and they, if I can say a majority of them, really reproduce what the cognitive empire has imposed on the continent, methodologically, theoretically, and in many ways. And I've experienced that because I built my intellectual career in Zimbabwe and in South Africa. So I know people who don't even, who thinks even thinking about decolonization is waste of their time. And they are located on the continent. So the geographical location, it's important, but it is not a determiner of the epistemic position. So it's important that we get that. And I raised the, the point again, which was raised by Ramon Grosshoke, that you will be surprised that the people who are located on the disempowered side of the modern power spectrum, speaking as though, epistemically, as though they are that other side. And to the extent of laughing at others who are actually when they belong to the same really social location, in, in, in so to speak. So it's a it's a very complex issue. Is it, it, it's it's we need to think about it at those three levels: the epistemic, the social location, and the geographical location. It is not as easy as that because you are located in Africa, therefore you are thinking decolonial. If you are located in Europe, you are thinking Eurocentric. It doesn't work that way. Is it? It's a personal commitment and a personal awareness and the consciousness of the problems which we are facing. Uh, and they, I must say that uh, uh, they, they are attempts even in the global north to, 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 to try and uh, enrich the knowledge which, which, which exists through bringing in epistemologies of the global south. I actually occupy a chair in epistemologies of the global south here at the University of Bayreuth. And it will be difficult in many African countries to think about such a chair in the first instance. They will think it is unnecessary to, to, to think about something like that. So, so these, are, these are good questions indeed, which must actually bother us for, for a longer time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor. Since we still have time uh, up to one o'clock, uh, we'll keep on asking questions. Uh, yeah, I call uh, the names, sorry. Uh, there, there's a question here. Oh, okay, uh, I will ask this one and then uh, uh, I will invite the professor to ask another question. Uh, yeah, from pro, uh, from Maposa, a uh, question from Maposa is here. You have described decolonization as an unfinished project. Are we making uh, a progress though? So do, do you see any progress in, in terms of uh, decolonization? And then yeah. another one, yeah. another one here is, uh, 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 I would like to have from Chikaipa, 
I would like to have your comment on whether the decolonial turn in the social sciences is a new fashion of uh, academic extra extractivism that promotes a, a sympathetic colonialism. Yes, uh, uh, let me invite uh, uh, the professor here from the floor uh, to ask uh, another question. Uh, Prof, uh, Gabriel here. Mm. Uh, the effect of colonization is deep in our blood, Prof. Yeah. Especially for those of us coming from the global south. Yeah. When I meet a white man, before even speaking, I already feel that I'm actually inferior. Mm. And I'm happy that you talk about decolonization as a method includes an act of remembering, yeah. collecting the pieces. Yeah. Yeah. So the question I would like to ask, probably you can elaborate more on, uh, on that in your answer, but I would like to ask, how does decolonization as method function in the context of our memory of suffering, mm. memory of our past burdens, memory of different kinds of memories of those coming from, let's say, the global south? Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, in fact, I think the, the three questions are actually related. And uh, one of my default positions when I'm faced with the difficult questions. I always say I don't uh, provide answers, I only respond. And uh, the beauty of responding is that it does not carry the same weight as the promise to give an answer. But let me, let me try to, to address these three. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, the idea of decolonization as an unfinished project has a number of uh, of, uh, of implications. Uh, and the, are we making any progress? I think for me, events such as roads must fall movements, fees must fall movements, Black Lives Matter movements. This is why I used the terms insurgent and the resurgent. They seem to be picking up the torch of decolonization, which as a result, perhaps of the 1970s, when we went to the Washington consensus, the structural adjustment programs, which aborted all the initiatives which were in place in terms of decolonization. As you know, Kwame Nkrumah worked very hard. Of course, we remember him as a Pan-Africanist, but sometimes we forget that he was also involved very deeply in the epistemic struggles to the extent that the establishment of the Institute of African Studies at Lekon was his initiative. And I remember his speech on the, the African genius. And they remember also uh, <clears throat> his speech on African Renaissance. And they remember also his initiative to bring WEP to, Boa, to, to Ghana to continue with the Encyclopedia Africana. I remember also the works which were taking place at the University of Ipatan with the veteran historians like Jacob Ate Ajayi, Kenneth DK, and, and the many others. Remember the work which was happening at Dakar with the, <clears throat> with the <clears throat> Sheikh Anta Diop and the others, including the president of Senegal, um, and Leopold Setas and Go, and his, his ideas of negritude and the African socialism. Remember the struggles which Ngugi was state, uh, was involved in uh, at the University of Nairobi, leading to that that debate on the abolition of the English department. Remember what also Samora Machel and the others they were trying to do at um, in the Maputo school uh, at at Mondane. So there, there there were so many initiatives, but in the seventies, the with the 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 triumphalism of neoliberalism and. Uh, and the, the Washington Consensus and the Structural Adjustment Program, there was this shift into corporatization, into into commercialization of knowledge, into 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 <clears throat> into turning students into customers, and all this, and all that tended to then uh, 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 put a stop to the initiatives which were going on, and they only to be picked 
uh, in recent years with the roads must fall, fees must fall. So they, 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 there is that momentum uh, of, uh, of, of movement in, in that direction. Uh, and then when it comes to decolonial terms uh, or the decolonial term, I think it's a name for a, a broader movement, which is not starting now. And I will always call it a long decolonial term because it is, you can go back as far back as the radical black tradition in the diaspora uh, with people like uh, W.E.P. Tupoa, people like uh, Sierra James and many others uh, fighting almost the, along the same lines we are fighting. And, uh, and that, that is why this, the unfinishedness of the struggle. And, they, and they, I was also speaking about it, not as a singular school, in order to take into account initiatives such as Negritude with its own problems, its own internal limits, uh, uh, initiatives like Gaveism with its own problem, with its own limits, the, the Pan-African Congresses with its own problems, with its own limits, the African personality from uh, Blyden, Edward Blyden, picked up by Nkwame Nkrumah in Conscientism, picked up by Ali Mazuri in terms of uh, the triple heritage and all that. All these, the issue is we must look at them as struggles. Knowledge produced in struggle is not as perfect as knowledge produced from an air conditioned office. These are knowledges produced in struggle and they will never be perfect. So we, they, they will always have their own limits here and there. So it's, it's important that we understand it in that context and that the struggle needs to continue. And the, <clears throat> the, 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 the question from the prof, the positionality which we take when we're pushing this issue of decolonization matters a lot. The attitude, the decolonial attitude, the decolonial attitude must be the attitude of love for one another what they call decolonial love. We must understand that we are speaking to people who have been dismembered. And they, these people, they will need really love. Uh, even some of them who are opposed to the whole project of decolonization, you will still need to work with them. And you will still need to demonstrate not, we need not to repeat the same logics of coloniality as we do decolonial work. I remember one of, one, one of my very good uh, colleagues who went to defend a PhD uh, in Australia. And then during the defense sample, they said, no, we need to give you five points on how to do this go to study. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, this guy said, but if I read your five points, it reads like you are saying I must do decoloniality in accordance with the criteria offered by coloniality. And that will be colonizing the whole project itself. So it's important that we need to do it in a different way. We need different values. We need different relationalities. We need we need need different. This is why I was always putting forward this issue: rethinking thinking itself. I think it's very important to 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 take it that far and to stretch our imagination that far. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for that uh, comprehensive response, not answer, ladies and gentlemen. So we are going to take two last questions. Uh, and the uh, first question will be from Dr. Mogodi. And Sabo just wanted to add on what Professor was saying and uh, to say that uh, colonization was a 500 year long process. So the decolonizing process might take longer and trying to see if we are making progress may put us in trap of giving up. We are trying uh, to undo a long history. So she is just adding on that. So Mamo Kodi, uh, Nina, you'll be next. Thank you very much, moderator. And thank you very much, Professor, for a very hey, empowering and um, enlightening lecture at the same time. Um, I stand here as a feminist. Uh, who is aware of the amazing work that's being done um, within the area of Afrofeminism. Mm. In particular, I'm thinking of the latest work by Sylvia Tamale last year. Um, the, she's written an amazing book on decolonization and Afrofeminism. Mm. Um, 
I would like uh, I would like you to comment on the fact that while we have been making great strides within the context of you know um, feminism and actually infusing uh, gender into our studies and our methodologies and so on, um, what is it within the tertiary space that continues to actually block much of this um, advancement and progress. Mm. We, we literally take five steps forward and 20 steps mm. back. Mm. So can mm. you assist us in that? I mm. think, um, you know, Sylvia, uh, who is also a good uh, activist and friend, is doing a great job. But mm. the, 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 the tertiary institution itself mm. is a big stumbling block. Thank mm. you. Mm. Do I take another one or I respond to this one? It looks like a, a loaded question. Uh, yes, we have a question from uh, Nina and uh, she's just being added right now to pose her question. Um, yes, thank you for this um, wonderful talk. Actually, if you've, you've addressed some issues I've been struggled for some time. So the one is about language. I was actually rather shocked when I learned this year um, that there's almost um, now African universities which teach sociology in their original language because like, as you know, Germany is uh, like in continent, uh, continental Europe has also its own language. It would have never come to my mind that you don't teach in your, um, in your mother tongue. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've got two questions concerning that. It's like, do you have any suggestions how this could work, for example, in Africa? And also, if we try to get rid of the colonial languages, do you would you suggest any models about how to communicate on an international scale? Because we were like well, well aware that in a way talking in English is a full compromise. Mm -hmm. And an Arabic question is, it's a little bit more tricky. Mm -hmm. What I found, like when, when what you've been talking also about, what Gabriel and I have been discussing about like um, self-induced pestimicide. Mm -hmm. I was really shocked that um, um, to learn that there's a lot of colleagues who seem to be shy um, of being part of the agenda, which mm -hmm. for example, if like as a scholar, let's say from Germany, you want to communicate with colleagues, it gets, a, it gets an evil touch because I feel replicating um, I feel replicating power structures because it is not my place to tell people, um, other people in other from other countries when I think they should be active. I just like, so for the center, this is a practical problem because we've had all these wonderful opportunities and we found that um, specifically African col uh, colleagues are shy of making use, um, use of this. So would you have some practical suggestions mm. how we could feel, move forward for that because all this whole ideas will be for nothing um, if scholars don't actually take the chance and make um, make mm. this project theirs because otherwise it will we will just replicate the whole new structures mm -hmm. and we're not we're well aware we cannot change them so these would be my questions on this sure sure is there another one or i just i respond Yes, uh, let's take uh, one last uh, gentleman and then you can sum up uh, the answers. No, the responses. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Prof. Mm -hmm. My name is Ernest Molloy. I'm not a scholar, I'm just a media person. Mm -hmm. Wanted to find out from you what the interface between what the interface between media and mm. academia is mm. in the in the decolonial debate. Mm. And, and then another personal question is, have you attended any initiation school? <laughs> uh, perhaps the last one is, when you spoke about uh, you know, some scholars who did work uh, in epistemology. I never heard you mention Marcus Gavi. Mm. What do you think about him? Mm. Oh, thank you. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I want to answer that one of the initiation school. <laughs> but uh, I, will, I will try to respond to others. 
uh, I've been initiated in different ways. Um, <clears throat> um, I think these are also important questions, uh, which uh, maybe starting with the one on the on the on the feminist Afrofeminism, and why is it difficult to to progress? Uh, I've been working at the University of South Africa for a decade and working uh, at the administrative level towards the end of my, my 10 years at the University of South Africa. And uh, I understand indeed what, what is being said about taking one step forward and a three step back, particularly in relation to, to the issue of uh, of gender equity, uh, feminism, and others. I think the problem is really the institutional cultures of modern westernized universities, which are actually patriarchal uh, uh, structures. And they, these structures, they actually, institutional cultures, they come from the very conception of the university in, 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 in its Western orientation. Of course, they were, Universities in Africa, Al Hazar, uh, Kerewin, and the and the and the and the and Sankore, uh, which I don't think they were reproduced. But what we have at the moment we is really the model of the Westernized university, and it came with the particular cultures, elitist cultures, and the elitism always going hand in hand with masculinity, and the, at the same time with patriarchy. So so the species is. Is when 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 race when when the the, the when when we when we did Africanization uh, in the sixties, most of the times it was to replace uh, the 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 colonials with the the, the locals, and it was mainly men uh, uh, rather than women were always fewer. But I tried to address this question when I was saying, even at a planetary scale, you will find that. Knowledge is mainly produced by men. Uh, even women in the Western, uh, they, are, they are not the majority in the production of knowledge. And they, you can demonstrate it by looking at sociology, the canon in sociology, what is called the canon in sociology. Four or five dead white men, there is not even a woman in that. So it's a, it's a planetary uh, institutional culture, which actually suppresses the, the, the <clears throat> The, the, the knowledge from women. And it might even take us back to, to what was happening with the banning of the witches, people who imported a knowledge in their bodies, being accused as witches and being banned alive. It can actually, you, you can have a historical genealogy of why we are where we are in this, in this, in this area. And, uh, and, 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 and I think we will need really to take it as serious as that to the extent that we must always say there can't be genuine decolonization without depatriarchization because they are so conjoined in a, inextricably. You, you can't separate them from the other. And this also speaks about the issue of language. But I want to say this about language, the question of language in Africa. Africans, there is no African who has no other language. Africans are multilingual in many ways. And the major problem with the colonial languages or the so-called colonial languages, which are also now spoken by other people as their language, even within the spaces where colonialism took place. The problem is when it replaces, and this is how Ngugi puts it, when it replaces what you use to be your language, and you are now speaking the colonial language in replacement of yours. That's where there is a problem. But if it is an addition to your own language, you become a better person. That's what Ngugi puts forward. So this fundamentally has implications for policy. It is not to expand and to remove, to, to, to remove and replace it is actually to enrich the space that even the African languages must actually be in the academy. 
so that the university doesn't become a monolingual space, but a multilingual space. And I remember at the University of South Africa, we took a very instrumentalist position, which was related to also one of the issues which we were facing, which was the high failure rate, that we will then translate the materials into, into the 11 South African languages. And they would begun to do that uh, for, for one college uh, <clears throat> in terms of, so that we increase access because the question of access uh, might even, even, even the, pest, the question of throughput might also be affected by the language question. The ability for some student to access the concepts which are rendered in a language which is not their language. And you remember this idea about stupidification of African children by taking them away from mother tongue into other languages. Then you say, ah, but this is a stupid person. He can't understand things. But the, the question is really the language which we are using. And here, I think we need to distinguish between language and communication. Language is not only communication. Language is also a career of knowledge. A career of culture is also part of definition of a people. So it's an important question. It's not really a question of communication. And you are asking, if we use African languages, how do we communicate with the other world? We never said we will not learn other languages. We are not colonialists who refuse to learn other languages. As African people, we learn other languages, but the problem is we don't want to be forced to do that. So the issue is we are not, in fact, thinking about ghettoization, closing ourselves from the world. We are already open, too open to the world and closed to ourselves by actually not using our languages within the institutions of higher learning. So that's, that's how, I, how I will put it. <clears throat> then for Modoy, Media, media has a, 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 an important role to play because what is it that constitutes news? What is it that is written and what is disseminated and what is mediated? Most of the time is mediation of coloniality. And it would be important for media to really work with us in the decolonial project so that it mediates what we are actually producing and it makes it accessible to a wider audience than a book and a general article. People always read newspapers, they read uh, uh, a digital uh, <clears throat> media. And they, we need to make sure that this debate actually goes into those spaces. And I think that will be the, a very good relationship we can establish. But uh, in terms of, I never mentioned Marcus Garvey. I think I mentioned Marcus Garvey. I actually mentioned Garveyism, which actually comes from from Marcus Garvey, and, uh, and how will I not mention Marcus Garvey? Marcus Garvey is one of the giants on whose shoulders I, we actually stand. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for uh, uh, this uh, very interesting topic. Uh, it's uh, very, very important, uh, the issue of uh, decolonization. Indeed, we need to be uh, decolonized uh, in the mind, the way we do things. And uh, we really need to value the, the knowledge that we, we really produced. Uh, yeah, I just, <laughs> I'm just remembering uh, how we invited uh, an African professor to review our programs sometime uh, in the past. And in the end, he looked at our programs at the University of Botswana Sociology, and he said, you know, this is a really a brilliant program. Mm -hmm. And then he talked about the staff, members of staff, that, you know, uh, we have well-trained staff uh, in the department. 99% uh, of them were trained in the UK and, uh, and uh, Canada. <laughs> so it means we really need to be uh, decolonized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, Thank you very much also uh, participants uh, for coming uh, all over the world. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, the, the, this topic. So these are the issues that we have to keep on, uh, uh, you know, uh, debating and uh, reflecting on. Uh, now at this juncture, let me uh, invite my co-moderator uh, mm -hmm. to uh, tell you what is next.
Thank you, Dr. Sechele. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the session. May I thank you, Prof, for the wonderful you. presentation, for the articulate and comprehensive responses you've done well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to take a break, but we should be uh, reconvening at 2 p.m. But make sure that you log in for your next sessions uh, from uh, at least 13.30, so that if you are part of the presenters or part of uh, the session uh, moderators, you are able to be made a uh, host and work with the, the, the IT or the media team. Uh, so the next uh, proceedings of the conference are parallel sessions. So ensure you've gotten the correct link so that you are on the right session that you want to join. Uh, kindly use those uh, links uh, for the stream parallel sessions to join them. Uh, they are on your program on uh, each respective uh, session. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a wonderful morning. Let's enjoy the afternoon.